Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today, we're doing three bonus episodes uh, talking about our recent research trip to China. Joining me here, both from the research trip and today on this podcast, are Pat Penny. Hey, hey. And Zong Jun Li. Hello. Hey, Pat. Hey, Zong Jun. So the three of us just got back from varying amounts of time in China, uh, both separately and together. In total, the research trip was about three weeks. The first week in Yixing and Chaozhou was all three of us. The second week in Yunnan was Zongjun and I. And then the last week in Taiwan uh, was just me. So today, let's talk about Yixing. That's what the current book is on. And that was the impetus for the entire trip. And so let's start with you, Pat. What did you think? What was the both the research trip in general, Yixing specifically? Yeah, it's so hard to just put into words, you know, the experience we had there. We were there for about three full days, so kind of four days with the travel days mixed in. And for context, I had been in China for three weeks at that point already doing work. And going from being in Shanghai for three weeks to being in Yixing felt amazing because Yixing, you know, while not that far from Shanghai, the air was clean, um, you know, it was quiet, it was spacious. So it really, it felt like, even though it was just two hours away, it felt like a, quite a getaway for me. So I was really loving it. I mean, I think you guys saw that. Like, I was just absolutely loving being outside the city, being somewhere where we could learn, right, about tea uh, and teaware. So, you know, it started off on a really high note. We had an amazing visit to a museum, which was just excellent. And we ended up getting quite, quite great treatment. Uh, and from there, it just got better and better as we visited potters and friends and started to get our hands uh, literally dirty with clay. Yixing certainly did feel a world apart. One, one thing I guess we should point out is people say Yixing, they talk about Yixing teapots and Yixing clay, but actually Yixing is the name of the county seat in the surrounding county, but we were actually in Dingshu town, which is a little tiny, tiny place. It's, it's kind of both hard to explain the scale of Yixing production, where every single store and every single storefront and every single business in that little village is Yixing, and there's so much Yixing production, uh, Zisha and related arts production going on. But at the same time, it's what Zongjin is like, 300,000 people or something. It's, it's, it's tiny by Chinese standards. Yeah, just another small town in China <laughs> with uh, 300,000 people. And that's just one county. So the county is pretty much equivalent of the sense of district in the States or elsewhere. It's actually underneath the Yixing city miniature but it's where most of the production of Yixing happens. What did you think, Zongjun? This was your, your first time in Yixing, uh, despite having lived in Shanghai for a few years. It ah, no, no, very... this is actually my second time. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. You did go once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was uh, in, uh, in Tianmuhu, which is also a famous place for Bai Cha, but I was there for hot spring. Then uh, on my way back to Shanghai, I passed by Yixing and uh, I stayed there for about four hours, mostly in the museum. But this is my second time and uh, everything just felt different, including the museum. They did a full renovation of the museum, which we highly recommended everybody to go visit that museum at least once in your lifetime. But last time I was there, it was two, two years ago. The museum was totally different. There weren't any well-curated exhibitions and uh, items in the museum. But this time, um, I think we, we learned quite a lot just by being in the museum for that time. And can we provide the official museum name just so that no one uh, goes to the wrong museum? <laughs> right, right, right. So there are many, quote, museums in Yixing. But this is the China Museum of Yixing Ceramics that you should go. There are a few other so-called museums, but they currently live in the legacy F1, F2 sites, which are less worthy to go, but are still worth a check. But first you should check the official museum. We should clarify the, the F1 museum is good, but not great, but there is an unfortunate habit within China of calling store, certain storefronts museums if they have the the artist's personal collection of something, and they're really more of a, a of a shop than a museum. Don't wander into a random museum assuming that it just because it has a museum in the name that it will be excellent. Yeah, and yeah. many copies, so you have to expect that when you're going to the F1 site, right, you're going to just be seeing copies. 
many of the originals are actually in the, the proper China National Ceramics Museum of Yixing Ceramics. One thing, Zongjin, that I wanted you to touch on is Yixing is both, like we said, very close to Shanghai, but it also feels a, a world away. And it doesn't seem to get many visitors by our reception. It seems to be that Yixing, despite being such an intense focus of, of the tea world and even the Western tea world, gets incredibly few visitors. Many people told us that we were the first foreigners, the, the first uh, white water and or, or Lawai <laughs> uh, to ever set foot in their store, which was shocking to us, both in the storefronts, the kilns, the clay processing studios. Everyone was like, oh, welcome. You're our first foreign visitors. We are so happy to have you. It was an incredibly gracious reception. But at the same time, I, I have to think to myself, Yixing is this huge thing. It's, it's one of the main topics that you learn about in tea. Like, where is everyone? Why why doesn't anyone go to Yixin? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's shocking to me too. Like Yixin not only just producing zisha, but it's also a main production place for daily usage ceramics or even porcelains. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, the pandemic. Maybe it's just not as touristy as uh, other places, which will attract other tourists from other places. But yeah, it's it's quite shocking to me too. Like not only Laowai tourists, but also like domestic tourists. We've been seeing very few of them. I had been to just weeks before that Longjing village in in Hangzhou, which similarly hour ish bullet train from Shanghai, and then you drive away from the city, and so you you feel like you're getting out there a little bit. And the number of domestic tourists that I saw when I was in Hangzhou and and specifically Longjing village was astronomical. You couldn't throw a rock without hitting twenty people, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, not that I recommend throwing rocks; it's probably a good way to get kicked out of the country. But <laughs> please don't. <laughs> uh, you know, we we got to Dingshu, and uh, there there was nobody, no no tourists of any sort that we saw at all. You know, even when we go to the museum, right, which is a site that you'd expect to see a decent bit of tourists in, quiet, and certainly it seemed like a lot of locals that were there. You know, lots of elderly gentlemen and women. We were we were by far the youngest people and certainly the most foreign. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, all of the descriptions and texts in the museum are pretty well translated. It's a actually very well curated and informative museum. And also, if you are looking for things that are not Yixin related, they recently renovated the entire Huanglongshan mining site into a national park, which is definitely worth checking. It's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful Qinglongshan. Qinglongshan. Oh, Qinglongshan, I'm sorry. Qinglong, yeah, Qinglong. Although done this year, next year, they're going to do it. They're going to turn the whole mining site into a park. So if you go yeah. to Yixing in another year or two, you'll get to go to both Qinglongshan and Huanglongshan as parks. But uh, yeah, talking about the park, that was really funny because we we looked on the map. We're like, this, this is Qinglongshan, right? It's in the right spot. And so we just walked into this park, which was absolutely beautiful. Gorgeous, gorgeous park. But I think there was a good amount of time where we were like 30% not sure, is this really Qinglongshan that got turned into a park? Because there's a defunct Ferris wheel, you know, sitting in the park and just lots of things that seemed a little strange and had us doubting whether or not that was actually Qinglongshan. But uh, yes, we got confirmation that we, we got to walk through a park that is actually in the site where the Qinglongshan mining site was. Zongjun was quite happy about the liminal space, the thick train cars and uh, <laughs> the, the defunct Ferris wheel. It's a personal aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, I like the design yeah. studio. <laughs> oh yes, the, the defunct design studio. One, one thing I would say is walking through Qinglongshan, the mining open pit mine was first accidentally flooded with water and then purposely flooded with water. So you're you're down pretty deep. You're down more than 30 feet deep when walking through the park from what street level is. And then there's water for probably another 30-ish feet below you. And we were staring at this stone and the rocks and the, on the exposed sides of the mountain. We were trying to figure out, is this or buried rock? And it, and it turns out to a, to a small extent for what we could see it was this Yellowstone layer above there's some jiani intermixed with it that you can see and then they said right in that area it was not predominantly a zisha mining site but there is jiang poni that was found there particularly during the reconstruction of the excavation so that that was pretty interesting to see it felt a little awestruck at first walking down into the mining site and being like is is this the spot it turns out it's not the spot but it is a spot 
Right. And yeah. a lot of that from when we uh, confirmed with with Potter friends, uh, a lot of the ore or, well, rock that we were seeing was limestone as well. Qinglongshan was at the time also a major production site for concrete and a limestone material. So a lot of them got turned into concrete-based material during the mining period. I think the point where we had the most doubt was we got through the entire park, which we, we took a nice hour and a half, two hour walk through, and then we find the actual official sign for the park, and it mentions absolutely nothing about Zisha Ore. It talks about chalk and concrete mining. So that, that was the point where all of us were like, is this the Qinglongshan? But it, it is. It turns that out was it a is. bad moment. That was a really bad moment where we were all so excited. We we're all like awestruck by, by these, by seeing, seeing the gradients in, in the mountainside, trying to identify different layers or strata. And then we get to the sign and the sign mentions nothing. They're like, they once made concrete here. <laughs> and we're all like, what, what have we been doing? Um, <laughs> Time to break out our concrete teapots. Some additional inquiry. That that would be brutalist. That we can we can test this. You know, it has a porosity oh. similar to certain Zisha glaze. <laughs> but we did we did confirm later, like, okay, we were not entirely crazy or off kilter that that was part of Qinglongshan mining area. <laughs> so do we want to talk a little bit more about the next day's activities? Do we want to go chronological or did you have a different flow you wanted to discuss? We could go chronological. The other thing we could do is we could just each pick one topic that surprised and inspired us and talk a little bit about that. Do you want to kick off with that, Jason? I would. I would say the thing that surprised and inspired me was when we first arrived seeing approximately 20 tons of aging clay in a single ceramic artist's studio. 20 tons and we're going to be like uh this is my clay that i'm aging to make machine teapots and specifically it was very high-end clay made from singular pure ores he was very clear i, I do no acid washing this is 100 percent natural clay and he proved it to us he unwrapped one of these clays we're like well why is it green he unwraps one of these clays and it's growing forest moss underneath the plastic in the aging container. and it, it's not algae it's not mold. I mean, we we took a look at it. It is straight up moss. I, Legit I, moss. Literally forest moss. So when they harvest the clay, there must be spores or, or some of these seeds. It's not bacterial growth. It's not algae, as we said. It is, it's a plant. You can like pluck the little leaves off. And we looked at it under a magnifying glass. It is forest moss. And to think to yourself, okay, well, most clay doesn't have this because it's either acid wash or processed in some way. And that means that there's so much organic matter in the Zisha, and that's why you have to age it. It was phenomenal. That was a uh, predominantly uh, Ben Sham Duani that we were looking at. Yeah, um, and we posted a photo of that exact Ben Sham Duani processed clay block with moss, and you actually staring at it, Jason. So if anyone wants a reference for this photo, it is on the uh, Instagram. But I did want to just add a little bit. Um, you said, you know, we saw 20 tons of stored clay. We went then to another site for this specific Yixing artist and saw another 20 tons they had stored. And they also mentioned that they still have 10 more tons. So this specific singular artist has 50 tons and that's just one artist. So I, I think that gives us a, you know, lots of confirmation that, you know, what we've said in the past is true, that there's no shortage of ready to go clay or clay that is, you know, currently aged or aging. So no, no need to worry, you know, go out and buy tons of teapots. They're not going anywhere. But those final 10 tons was unprocessed ore. So he has a further 10 tons of unprocessed ore. But, you know, one thing to give us a little bit of pause to make our merchant friends happy is that he did say it's becoming increasingly difficult to buy any new ore, that there's been a repeated crackdowns and that no additional new ore is forthcoming. Until yeah. they do construction on Huanglongshan. <laughs> yeah. So the story that we heard is that there has been mining activities going on until 2017, but there's a major accident happened in one of the uh, illegal mining sites at the region. And ever since then, the government has really strengthened up the regulations on mining activities. So that's uh, quite unfortunate, but the good news is they're building the uh, Huanglongshan National Park very soon. So <laughs> we might be having uh, more supply of ores. That, and then that story future. is actually pretty pretty cool. What they, they said is that people buy a, a condo or a townhouse in one of the developments that's over one of the old shaft routes. 
and then they illegally dig down through the the basement yeah 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 to, to reach the ore and so that's a it's a pretty cool story yeah those houses along Taodu Road, which they can uh, harvest jiangpuni, is pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. Something else, something else we were told that was really interesting, right? When we asked about the regulations around mining and how much illegal mining was happening, you know, it was mentioned to us that the people who are overseeing and in charge of enforcing these regulations are tea drinkers themselves. So it sounds like a, a blind eye was turned for quite a while, maybe until the uh, illegal mining incident that Zhong Jun mentioned in 2019. 2017, to clarify. Thank you. Zhong Jun, what was the moment that shocked and inspired you in Yixing? So we basically visit many traditional teapot makers on our first day of visits in Yixing. And uh, we saw a lot of the traditional making techniques, processing, and uh, on day two, so my father introduced us to a bunch of Yixing artists that also does Yixing teapot designs and Yixing ceramic designs in, in Yixing and Dingshu County. It's just so fascinating to see the entire Yixing industry has been really divided into two categories. You have like these uh, teapots that are made for the sole purpose of, you know, tea usage, right? To brew better tea for better Gongfu tea practitioners. But on the other hand, you have these entire different category that their sole purpose is to make the most artistic design of teapots that are not, you know, really intended for daily usage. So you see a kind of a fusion and emerge during the master era in the ROC or Lei Qing. But to nowadays, these two categories really have been divided, diverged. They kind of lift into entirely independent community to some extent. Do you want to mention the uh, Douyin live sales that we saw? <laughs> I think it would be better for you guys to comment because I've seen it. <laughs> for those of you who don't know Douyin, it's a, uh, how to describe it, it's a cross between Amazon, eBay, and an infomercial all rolled up into one. It's, uh, and it's, it's TikTok though. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's the Chinese version of TikTok. But uh, it's the shopping ver it's the shopping subcomponent of the Chinese version of TikTok because TikTok has the dancing and the nice reels and, and other things, I guess, but with integrated sales functions with integrated sales functions. So instead of having influencers who are like, oh, you should go to that brand store. Here's a link and go buy those things. Instead, it's multiple camera angles of someone holding something and talking about why they like it and there might be one of it there might be a hundred of it right but it's available for one click you know instead of double tap to like it's double tap to purchase these things happen rapidly and we got to go into a, a douyin studio selling yixing teapots moving massive volumes of yixing teapots what was it they, they had sold something like a hundred thousand renminbi of teapots that day and we got to go into the studio and there was a woman there in a full, uh, what looked like a proper TV studio, holding a Yixin teapot, explaining it. And six guys looking at statistics, manning cameras, monitoring the live chat, determining sales price and sales volumes, another couple of gaffers and helpers switching out teapots to the next one. It was unlike anything I've, I've ever seen. Yeah, and we were kind of sitting there whispering in the background, taking it all in. But um, whoever was, you know, watching this basically QVC of a commercial on their Douyin app, some people were hearing us and typing into the chat like, oh, you know, we hear English. Where's the English boyfriend? Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of things like that. So we, we were, unfortunately, I think our, our voices were heard in, uh, in the live sale, but didn't seem to hurt the sales. Yeah, well, this uh, must be a culture shock for you guys, but uh, this is actually quite common in a lot of industries here in China for uh, many years, like in uh, cosmetics, in uh, F&B, in many of these fast consumer products that we've been seeing nowadays. I they think all that's what was shocking for better it, sales. Was that I, we're so used to seeing it with those type of products, and I think I wasn't prepared to see it with Yixing. I wasn't prepared to see it at all. I don't even use American social media or Western social media. So there was a double impact <laughs> for me <laughs> seeing, seeing Yixing being sold on Douyin. That was, uh, that was quite interesting. But to your point, Zongjun, it was all artistic Yixing that was being sold. Artistic or mass market Yixings or gadgets made by Yixing clays. Well, I got my pig's nose cha-chong. <laughs>
Yeah, we were all looking to pick up new cha-chongs. Out of only the purest clay. I don't know if you have anything more to say, but the two separate worlds of Yixing, the artistic Yixings and the, the Cha-ren Yixings, and, and then both being located in this tiny Dingshu town, but having absolutely no conception, no overlap, no interaction with, with each other was very strange. I mean, with our artistic friends, we went and we drank coffee before, and it was a couple hours before we actually had any tea. They thought of Yixing as a sculptural art form. And they thought of yixing the sculpture before they thought of yixing the teapots before they thought of yixing as a, as a way of improving your tea. We knew that that had existed in the past. It was quite strange to be interacting with that at a very serious level, people making, you know, real business out of it with real buyers all over China. I don't know if I really expected there to be that much of a, of a separation in the market. They themselves have labeled themselves as separate and they, they call themselves artists and the other Yixing workers, they call them craftsmen, and they've kind of delineated it that way in their head. They are making serious art. And some of them that we've been seeing, for example, like clay painting, those are national heritage level art that we end up seeing and uh, interact with the artists. But it's also very interesting that they would call those Yixing artists who are making more of the Charen oriented Yixing teapot craftsmen. They wouldn't necessarily see them as uh, artists, which, uh, you know, makes sense in some aspects, like for the charm oriented teapots, they do have more uh, simple designs in general, but it's really just, a, I, I would say a different mindset of viewing teapot or zisha from the two communities. The last thing we'll say about that before we let Pat talk about his wow and surprising moment is that for the most part, the artistic Yixings sell for a higher price than the quote-unquote craftsman Yixing. Oh, much higher, much higher price. Like 10x or 20x, sometimes 40x. Irrelevant of the clay quality. Irrelevant of the clay quality. They are not intended for, <laughs> for tea usage, I would say. <laughs> Pat, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, for sure. So I think definitely everything you guys mentioned were, were all big learning points for me. I think the one major takeaway for me that kind of was just like, wow, is that except for maybe some of the grandmasters, most Yixing are kind of a, a work of a community. So when you get a pot, it's very likely, unless you paid thousands of dollars that, and maybe more than that, that your pot was touched by many hands, you know, before it became the, the singular pot that you bought from one artist. So just because you buy it with that one artist shop or from that one artist, uh, it's likely that, you know, somebody who specializes in firing did the firing. It's likely that somebody did lid adjustments, Junko, which we learned about and got to see. It's likely that somebody might have done uh, handle or spout adjustments and fixing and flattening or texturizing on the outside of the pot. And so I think just seeing how many different hands are involved in a lot of these specialized skills within the, the art of making a teapot. That was really, really fascinating that it's, it's very rarely the work of one craftsman, but many times, uh, you know, a, a village, right. To make a single teapot. Even within the studio, most studios have one specialist making spouts. Most studios have one specialist making handles or making molds or shape guides for handles, uh, not, not slurry molds. And we even went to a specialist knob maker who all they make are the teapot lid knobs because most studios don't make those in-house. I think that was the funniest one for me as we showed up with a, uh, basically a slab of clay, processed clay that the Yixing potter we were working with wanted to use. He shows up the knob specialist, gives her basically a shape guide. This is the example that I want you to, to mold it after. And we came back a few hours later, right? To pick up some knobs. Like a couple hundred knobs. <laughs> And she had a wall of knobs of different shapes. You could have walked in and been like, I need this clay, not uh, shape 199. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that was just fascinating. Just seeing how many different specialists are involved with making a single pot. It's a really a, a lively ecosystem that we are seeing in Yixing. It's quite fascinating. It and is, also we ended up really had a deep dive in every single process because it was the firing day and, you know, teapot pickup day for one of our artist friends in Yixing. So we end up really be able to observe each individual process that had to involve in the Yixing production, which is quite awesome. We got to go to an electric kiln, a pushback kiln, a wood-fired kiln, 
We got to go to a specialist knob maker, as Jason mentioned. We got to go to a studio where they were building the pots. So seeing people work with handles, spouts, the bodies of teapots, making filters. We got to see Junko. We got to see things like silver molding. Got to see things like inscription. Uh, what else did we see? Because we or, really saw... processor. We spent a lot of time in an ore processing facility looking at stone grinders, uh, Raymond mills, various other forms of sifting, magnetic sifters. I mean, we, we had just published those chapters. It was a huge relief that there was no major revisions. There's no <laughs> revisions from what we've written necessary. I think even so that we're, we're still missing a few things that we got to do over the, the three days that, that we were there. And of course, we visited the Dragon Kiln. We did visit the Dragon Kiln. We'll have a lot to say on the Dragon Kiln. <laughs> I think before we uh, wrap up, just wanted to also mention, I think we said already the hospitality we received while we were there was amazing. People were very friendly towards us, but uh, the food, the food was pretty great. I'm going to mention the same thing. The food in Dingshu Town was a lot of mountain vegetables and Taihu Lake fish. You know, some of our friends said, yes, the food is good, but it, it's all one cooking style. But that anyway, race. we were we were there for a while and we had a lot of different things that I thought were, were excellent. Yeah, the rep braised bamboo chicken, the rep braised pork chop, the rep braised Taihu Lake fish. We also had the giant stone bowl, not yixing, a soup. It was probably uh, nunny, it was white, white giant soup bowl on a, on a flame, cauldron style. That was excellent. The uh, duck feet in uh, soybeans was excellent. The wild mountain vegetables and the, the bitter bamboo was excellent. It was all so, so, so delicious. But I will say, when we talk about our next part of the trip, Chao Zhou, the food in Chao Shan was a little better than the food in Yixing. But it's a preference thing, I think. It was a step up. I mean, that area is also famous for its food and has a wider variety of food. Yeah, it's um, a place where Guangzhou people would go for food. So <laughs> let's just yeah, put it that way. Well, everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Please join us again for the next two bonus episodes on this 2023 research trip debrief. We're happy to have you listening. We're happy to have you reading. There's going to be a lot more new updates in the book. There's going to be a couple of revisions. We've got some better photos that we'll be replacing. And overall, this trip was incredibly inspiring. This is you know, part of the, the reason and the drive that allows us to, to write such in-depth content. So thank you for being a subscriber. Thank you for being a listener. And looking forward to writing and finishing the rest of this book on Yixing.